Today, we have Jeremy Miller uh, from Growing Pains, and uh, we've been trying to get together for a while, so I'm, I'm quite excited to have him on the show. So uh, welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on. Um, yeah, it's good to finally be able to get on, huh? <laughs> yeah, it really is. I'm just glad that I was able to, you know, finally work out the schedule with you. So anyway, um, well, why don't we start right, right from the start? I, I was curious. What was your your first audition like? Because all I've heard is, oh, I went in and they thought I was cute and I was on the show. What what was the actual process though? How did how did you end up, you know, well, with this? The thing is that kind of was how it went down. Um, the original audition was what we used to call a cattle call. Um, yeah. There were somewhere around three hundred kids, I believe, they brought in, you know, for Ben that they saw over however many days. But when I went in, I I didn't even read lines, if I remember correctly. I don't I don't even recall reading the script. Wow. Um, I just went in and started telling jokes and telling stories. And I had a really high pitched voice back then. So I could do like dolphin squeaks. So I was doing dolphin <laughs> calls. That was one of the jokes the producers used for years was the only reason I got the job was my dolphin calls. Um, oh my gosh. But I think that's what they really liked was that I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they was it was that's what came through was I was a normal kid and that's what they were looking for. Was the you know it's funny because you're kind of well known for the Ben Seaver scream. <laughs> was that was, was there any origination there? Were they what they saw in the the first audition? No, no, no. There was a. Uh... I don't even remember when, what episode that, that originated in, but that just kind of came about organically. I think it happened in one or two episodes and they were like, Hey, this is kind of funny. Let's keep it rolling. And that became one of my signatures. And thankfully I had good, strong vocal cords. So it never bothered me. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that you're, you're, it's kind of iconic. It's like one of those things, like people just know it, you know, I mean, it's that easy. Um, it, it's kind of funny being, uh, you know, known and associated with it, but it's, it's, it's a kick. Yeah, I get you. So um, when was the first time that you actually met Kirk Cameron and Tracy Gold? What, 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 you know, when, when did that happen? I didn't actually meet. Um, well, I met them separately, actually. Hmm. Tracy was not the original Carol. Oh, wow. When we filmed the pilot, it was a actress named Elizabeth Ward. And for the, so I met her and I met Kirk and Joanna and Alan on day one of filming. Um, well, of rehearsals and then filming and everything. We never met before that. I didn't screen test with them. Wow. Um, I guess being such a little kid, they didn't need me to screen test with the others. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I met them all the very first day of filming. But we filmed the entire pilot with Elizabeth Ward. And then I guess in the test groups, there was something about her that didn't click with the fans. Um, they didn't, for whatever reason, buy her as the daughter. She didn't seem to fit in the family. So they um, recast. Tracy had already auditioned for it multiple times and they had really liked her. So that's who they decided to go with. I didn't meet Tracy until our very first photo shoot for ABC, our big publicity shoot. We hadn't even filmed the pilot yet. Wow. She got hired and they sent her right to the publicity shoot. Um, Annie Leibowitz, very famous photographer, oh, very was, famous. Doing our, was doing our pictures. And again, that's when I first met Tracy. And being the rotten little brother that I was, I mean, day one, I, I started messing with her mind a little bit and, you know, saying, oh, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Da, da, da. Oh, so how old are you? What do you do? You know, and um, she kind of told me and I said, I thought they said you were this. And she's like, well, I kind of told them that. <laughs> so what I told her was that, oh, man, that's I won't tell anybody because the first girl, that's why she got fired. She lied about her age. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy was all worried all day during the photo shoot. I was a rotten little brother. Oh my God, you were perfect for the part. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So what was it like when you did meet uh, Kirk for the first time? What was, what was the vibe? Um, that was the thing about the show is everybody was great. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was, everybody was laid back. I mean, we didn't have that instant connection where it was like, oh, my long lost big brother kind of a thing. Right. But that developed rather quickly. Um, you know, with both Kirk and Tracy, because we 
not only were we um, filming together every day, but we were in the school together every day as well. We were in our mm -hmm. set school um, together for three hours a day and, you know, messing around, doing our work. I mean, we got our work done, but we were, you know, kids. So we, we messed around, we played jokes, we did all that stuff and we bonded really quick. That's pretty cool. What, you know, it's funny because I have heard this too, that, you know, that you, you guys played pranks on one another. What kind of pranks did you guys play? Because I'm always intrigued, oh, like man. offset, what was going down? All sorts of different things. I mean, from things as simple as making um, mustard water with a little bit of food coloring in it and, you know, bringing it to them in the morning and saying, hey, I got you some orange juice. Um, <laughs> to us putting a clean mind you but clean uh trash bin it, basically i snuck in through the window of tracy's um i snuck in through the window of tracy's trailer and uh unlocked everything filled up this this big trash can and leaned it against the door at an angle oh. and then locked it again got back out through the window and on monday morning when she came in um kirk and i were kind of just hanging outside our trailers for whatever reason and she opened her door and she got drenched and you know kid stuff oh my gosh i mean seriously that's a good one like that's a really good one <laughs> that wow. one was mine but i got it <laughs> Well, you must have, I, yeah, I just got the feeling that like you did have some fun on the set. What, um, you know, look, I, you know, the elephant in the room is that I, obviously that Alan Thick passed away and I know that you were really close. So I, I'd love to just address that. What, um, what was, what was your relationship with him? Like from the get go, did, did that build or was that kind of a, a close bond? Um, again, it built rather quickly, but it did have to build but I never felt awkward around him or Joanna mm -hmm. um, in particular, I guess, probably because I was re raised by a single mom. I felt very close to Joanna immediately. Mm. Um, that was probably helped along by that very first episode where she was going back to work. Her and I have a very kind of tender moment at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. probably by the end of the week, after sitting on her lap and telling her how bad my day was and having her mom me out, I had already like, that was my second mom, you know? Yeah, and the funny, the, thing is, the funny thing is when we were filming it, I believe it was on filming day, we got done with that scene and Joanna's real daughter, Ashley, was on set. Oh, wow. And she came, she was maybe six at the time. And she comes storming over to me and goes, you know, when she's doing that scene, she's thinking about me. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she runs off. That is hysterical. So she's six and what, why aren't you like eight? Something yeah, like I was that? about eight at the time. Oh, funny. Oh my gosh. That's great. So, but no, we, we all bonded really quickly. And Alan was wonderful with all of us from the jump i mean it re he really was he was very paternal he you know had kids of his own who were around our age and i mean yeah. robin and i are within a year of each other and his older son brennan is a little closer to kirk's age um he he always looked out for us whether it was when we were filming whether it was you know no matter what it was Alan always kept an eye out for all of us. And, you know, he kept the set fun. I mean, how could you not have fun with a man that was as, as absolutely brilliant and funny as he was? Um, Ad-libbing constantly and just every time it said cut, cracking jokes and messing with everybody, messing with the crew, messing with us. In particular, his favorite was messing with Joanna. Um, they love to, you know, poke at each other. Wow. Wow. Was that, you know, it's funny. I think, you know, I, I, I myself, I, I do have an acting background, but I think of ad libbing, I think, oh, fun. But then I think you're eight years old. It was that ad libbing hard for, for you when somebody would go off on the, you know, say something different. Alan thankfully did most of his ad libbing during rehearsals. And it wasn't all the time, but when he kind of just got something, he'd go with it. Sometimes it'd make it in, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, I don't know how many times we'd be filming, or not filming, but in rehearsals. Mm -hmm. 
the producers would be there watching the rehearsals and he'd do something that wasn't in the script. And all of a sudden they're having a meeting, you know, back where the producers hang out for like a good 10 minutes. And he comes back out and he's like, okay, we're doing it the way I just did it. We're changing this. And they'd rewrite an entire scene with one of the writers. And um, Alan was just an incredibly creative and incredibly talented guy. But wow. it was nowhere near as bad, like I said, because it usually happened in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I was good friends with uh, the kids on Home Improvement. Oh, yeah. And they went through hell with Tim Allen. Because, <laughs> and I'm not saying he was mean in any way. It's, no. He, he ad-libbed all the time in filming <laughs> with the cameras rolling. And these poor kids are just, you know, just this is their first big show and this is wow. and they're waiting for their cue and it never comes because he changed the entire dialogue oh man i mean that's hard so it took them a long time to get used to that kind of stuff and for him to learn to dial it back just a bit with the kids um in those scenes and stuff but i didn't have it nearly that hard it was just an occasional line here or there during rehearsals and oftentimes like i said it would make it in <laughs> right right what uh, by the way since you brought that up what were some of the other stars of other shows that were around where you were filming that you know you recall well the thing is where we were filming was the burbank ranch oh, wow. and that was their little lot that was used almost almost exclusively for um location shoots okay so fantasy island set was on there their old West set where they shot a lot of Westerns and stuff was on there. Um, they had the quote unquote suburban family street surrounding mm -hmm. a park. And it was an actual big park in the middle of the, in the middle of the lot with, wow. a, with a couple of streets built around it that they could film on. Um, we were the only show or at least the first show television show to be on that lot. So we had it to ourselves for, I think it was, two years wow um then they brought on um my sister sam with pam dauber mm -hmm. and rebecca schaefer right and that of course only lasted about a year and a half because my dear friend rebecca was killed by a stalker and you were um, close with her huh i didn't i didn't i didn't even know that. well we worked right literally right next door to each other there were only two sound stages on the warner brothers ranch at the time Wow. So we were in one and they were literally eight feet away in another soundstage. So we saw each other every morning when we got to work. We, you know, talked as kids on lunch when we got out of school and stuff. And I, I knew her pretty well. That's pretty um, crazy. I mean, I'm I'm just putting myself in your shoes and I'm thinking, wow, you're what, nine, nine and a half. And and you, you know, someone like this literally gets, you know, killed. Uh, that's yeah. a lot to take on as a young kid, by the I way. I think I was around 10-ish, maybe 10 and a half when that happened. Okay. Uh, Might have even been pushing 11 by that point. But it was still, I mean, it was a very young age. And we all found out, and I mean, including her castmates and crew, they found out because she didn't show up for work Monday morning. Oh, wow. You know, this was not the age of, of cell phones and internet and right. instant Immediate. information. Yeah. It, this happened over the weekend. The police hadn't even notified her family yet because she was living alone in an apartment, um, in yeah. a condo type thing. So it it was, she didn't show up for work on Monday morning. That's what got the ball rolling and how we all found out something had happened to her. Oh um, so gosh. yeah, that was rough and it was a little scary. Um, you know, thankfully for, you know, God bless her out of her death came most of the stalking laws we have on the books today. Right. It, it was the actual event that, that was the catalyst for making it happen. Um, nobody really understood at that point what stalking really was, what the psychosis and mentality of it right. and how truly dangerous it could be. Um, that was the one that made people go, holy crap, we have to do something about this. Right. So um, there are actually pretty strict stocking laws in place now, um, you know, solely thanks to Rebecca's passing. Boy, that's really something. Um, tell me this, you know, at the time I'm thinking Kirk Cameron, I mean, he was he was huge. Mm -hmm. We're in it. How big was he then? Like, were people waiting for him outside the gates? Was it, you know, oh, what was that like? 
it was insane. I mean, people don't realize people are used to a whole nother level of celebrity right now because of social media, because of how the reach you can get now. Right. In a day when you only had a pencil and paper, Kirk was receiving 7,000 plus handwritten fan letters a day. A day. A day. Oh my gosh. 7,000 plus handwritten letters a day. Wow. He had people waiting outside the gates. He had people follow him home. He had people follow him on the freeway. He had someone run him off the freeway, or not off, but onto the edge and stop his vehicle so they could get out and ask him for a picture. Oh, wow. His life became like nothing you've ever, you know, ever Mm -hmm. ever thought of he couldn't go anywhere he couldn't do anything it was real you know rough for him for a little bit in that you know he was still a kid yeah exactly he didn't have what you have now where kids like him were traveling with you know uh, an entourage of bodyguards and all this other stuff that Mm -hmm. just didn't exist um and truthfully the salaries were smaller Oh yeah. And I mean, course. it's not that Kirk wasn't making very, very good money, but to sure. give you an just to give you an example, I mean, I did very, very well on the show, but my mm-hmm. last year, I only made in the low to mid five figures an episode, which is amazing. Yep. I know what you're saying though. Angus Young was making 375000 an episode. <laughs> right. More than 15 times what I was making. Yeah. You know. So again, it was a, it's a different time. Kirk's yeah. family, although living well, and Kirk living well and comfortable, he wasn't able to hire, hire 24-hour security to follow him around right. all the time and all that other. That just didn't happen like it does now. So his, his life got very interesting and very difficult in a lot of unexpected ways. Wow, that is pretty wild. Jeez. So um, when, you were, when you were on Growing Pains, I mean, the famous person that always comes to mind in my brain is Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay. Mm-hmm. When he came on, this is another thing that I, I've heard and tell me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. there was a little bit, I, because he was kind of with you, it was a little bit of what, you know, kind of like, why are you bringing him in kind of vibe? Is that true? There was for me. Um, at that point in time, Kirk was, his popularity was definitely waning a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, He had found his faith in his spirituality and had really asked the producers and the writers to make his character more responsible and more, you know, not such a player and all this other stuff. Well, he took away a lot of what made people love Kirk or love Mike. Exactly. Yeah. And his popularity started to wane. Um, ABC felt they needed another heartthrob to fill his shoes. Hmm. Wow, I felt I should have gotten that opportunity, you know, um, at the time I really did. Now, Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know and don't care. But at the time, it was like, wait a second. My shows, the ones that get written about Ben that are centered around Ben, are the highest rated of our season every year from sixth season and seventh season. Mine tended to be the highest rated. So I was getting more popular. Had they written it to involve me more, give me cooler things to do, all that kind of stuff, it would have been, it, it could have gone another direction. Is Instead, that they decided they decided to put me in glasses and nerd me out even more oh and bring in Leo to be the next heartthrob guy. So I wasn't bitter or resentful towards Leo at all. But right. it was towards, towards the network. It was just kind of like, what the hell? You know, I, I you could have given me a shot. I could have pulled it off for you. Yeah, no um, kidding. You could have. Wow. But, sorry. It's OK. Did you um, did you remain friends, by the way, with Leo? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we Leo and I were never friends who hung out together. We hung out on set. We hung out, you know, because we enjoyed each other's company. We got along, but we didn't hang out outside of work. Um, Mm -hmm. He already had a a kind of set group of friends who 
I didn't get along with most of very well. It was mm-hmm. just personal stuff, yeah. but I wasn't big fans of them. So I didn't really ask to go hang out with him. I didn't invite him out with me. We just had separate groups we, we hung out with. Um, but we stayed, you know, we, we were buddies. Whenever we got a chance to see each other, it was, it was awesome. We'd run into each other at Jerry's Deli or at some yeah. restaurant or some party or something. And we'd spend, you know, 20 minutes catching up and saying hi and hanging out and talking throughout the night. Um, but then we'd go our separate ways. And that's kind of always how it was. Were you blown away when he took off like a rocket? Um, blown away, I would say blown away is a strong word because okay. we all saw talent. I mean, we all we all knew this kid had something special. I mean, I don't even Alan admitted nobody saw this. I mean, right. You know, but still, there was something really special about this guy. Mm-hmm. And um, when he really started to let loose and I'll tell this little story and I'll, I'll preface it by saying it wasn't me. I'm not taking credit, but. Early on, when Leo first came on, I think it was after the first episode, the producers asked me and our script super or our script uh, dialogue coach uh-huh. to work with him a little bit on loosening up because he was really, really tense and it was coming through on screen. Wow. Um, so we started working lines with him at lunch, and the dialogue coach and I. I mean, we talked about it a little and we were like, dude, why don't we see you on camera? It's like, you're crazy. You're funny. You're zany. You're, you're a Harpo Marx and, you know, Buster Keaton combined. I mean, why yeah. aren't we seeing that on screen? Yeah. And he just started kind of loosening up and being himself and going with it. And you saw it click. It was like the third episode, I think. Oh my god! And it just, it clicked. And you were like, damn, this kid's fun. This is going to be good. And you just saw it when he really started to loosen up and be more natural and just go with it and was able to get out of his own way. Um, God, he was just, he was awesome. And we all, I don't know if we all, again, we didn't think it would go to this level. I don't think anybody could foresee that. But Mm -hmm. he left our show to go do the Robert De Niro film, This Boy's Life. That's why he was released from his contract. Oh, my gosh. So when your first job after Growing Pains was to go star, not just to work with, to go star in a film with Robert De Niro, you knew that something. this kid was going places. I mean, you knew he was... it was going to be get big. I mean, just from that very first project. Wow. Isn't that interesting? You know, I, I'm not saying that you're taking credit or not, whatever, but that is so interesting because that's a pivotal moment, actually, a bit in 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 shifting his his whole dynamic. That's pretty cool. No, I, I have to believe he was a smart enough guy and had good enough people around him. He would have gotten there eventually. Uh, mm-hmm. because he is just that talented but right. um yeah we were just sitting in my trailer running lines and that was kind of that was what kind of started it it was just we want to wow. see more of you and as soon as that started happening man he just i mean the, i think it was the third episode he just tore it up he's got this deep crying scene and all this uh, and we're just sitting there watching him going oh all right i remember that crying scene and you're absolutely right it was pretty intense that's wild yeah. Wow. So, so now on another, I, I guess on more of the personal front while you're on the mm-hmm. show, you, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I looked into you very, very thoroughly. It was actually a lot of fun, but I noticed, I was kind of blown away. You dated Kirk's sister. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Um, Candace and I, I mean, I say dated, yeah. we, we were, we were, you know, going together, yeah. you know, kind of stuff. Um, we didn't go anywhere, but Yes, Candace and I were kind of boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, young, like 12 years old wow. kind of thing. And uh, we we talked on the phone all the time. That's basically what it consisted of. We'd see each other on set occasionally. And then we got to spend time together at any um, any parties, you know, uh, whether mm-hmm. it was birthday parties for the cast or crew or family, or it was like our rap party or our Christmas party or anything like that. So those were our dates essentially where we'd get to see each other and dance and spend time together but yeah Candace and I were good friends and we were all of us kids on the set were really good friends 
Um, we all hung out together whenever we could because we were all so close in age. We were all within about a year to a year and a half of each other. So right. my brother, Josh, Candace, uh, Kirk's other sisters, Bridget and Melissa, Tracy and Missy and her younger sister, Brandy, um, you know, Joanna's daughter, Ashley, who I already talked to. I mean, we were all just this big group of obnoxious, fun kids that like to or got the opportunity to hang out together. That's pretty cool. And then the other the other one that blew me away is you now. Well, OK, dated, went out with whatever uh, Danica, Danica uh, McKellar. I was Danica, like, Danica's the first girl I can say I actually dated um, because I had to woo her. Um, she wanted not nothing to do with me. We were kind of becoming friends. We all met at a couple of events, but where, I had. Where a, were you age wise between the two of you? Danica was, I want to say, a year or a year and a half older than me. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm this little 12 year old trying to hit on this 14 year old, basically. Wow. And, you know, she's like, yeah, yeah, you're a cute kid, you know kind of a thing i think she's maybe 13 like i said we we're about a year and a half apart whatever direction yeah, and yeah, yeah. um so i'm like thinking away i'm like i asked her out and she said no and i'm just like i this I, I gotta go out with this this girl so it happened to be 1988 batman was going to be premiering the michael Ke keaton batman jack oh, nicholson yeah, yeah. It's such a huge premiere that they have actually rebuilt a little part of Westwood to look like Gotham. Oh, wow. And they're wow. having the premiere in Westwood at these two theaters that are opposite each other. It's a dual premiere. It's playing in both theaters simultaneously. Oh, my gosh. And it was this huge event. Everybody's dying for tickets and no one can get them. Well, I work for Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> So I call the PR department immediately and I'm like, I don't care what you have to do. You've got to get me two tickets to the Batman premiere. I'll, <laughs> I'll go to anything you want. I'll do anything you need. I need the two tickets. Oh, is and that sure funny? enough, they got them. And I got to call Danica and say, hey, um, I happen to have two tickets to Batman's the Batman premiere. Would you like to go with me? Wow. And I did it upright, uh, rented us a limo and we went to uh picked her up went to the premiere had a blast when we got done had the limo take us out for ice cream and um stuff afterwards and oh, come on. i we dated for like the next two years <laughs> two years oh my gosh that's wild oh okay wow that really that really worked out for you that's terrific <laughs> Oh, that's and pretty cool. Danica and I are still friends. Um, she's a total sweetheart and a brain and a genius. And um, but yeah, just just a wonderful one. I'm very lucky that all of my friends from back then I'm able to keep in contact a little bit with. I get to see them through whether it's you know get togethers, parties that we have, you know, through mutual friends or PR events where we're all back together. But I'm very blessed that all of those guys, I mean, the kids from Who's the Boss? I mean, Alyssa Milano and Danny Pintaro yeah. and the Mr. Belvedere kids and Bryce yeah, Beckham. Are you talking about Rob Tracy. Stone and, and yeah. those guys? Rob Stone. Rob, Tracy Rob's Wells. a friend of mine. That's so oh, funny. Please, please tell Rob I said hi. I haven't I seen will. him in forever. Oh, that's hysterical. So yeah, you know, all we were all we were all around each other. Even the kids who weren't on ABC were still a, a lot of the same PR things or the same, you know, traveling together for like I'll give you an example. I don't remember if it was Bop or Teen Beat, but it was one of the two. Yeah. And every year they would hire a bus, like a big tour bus to take like 50 or 60 of us kids you know, down to either San Diego or Palm Springs or something like that. Oh, and wow. just give us like a weekend to all have fun and, you know, hang out together. We'd go to like water parks and the zoo and they had this club that on certain nights was a under, under 21 dance club with no alcohol. Yeah. And they'd rent it out for a night for us one night. And they just, they'd take pictures of the whole thing. And that would be an issue each year. Wow. And, you know, we got to have those times. So, it was, I mean, every show you can think of from back then, I mean, Small Wonder and uh, Step by Step. And, oh, my I mean, gosh. Everybody was on these trips. Charles in Charge, you know. It yeah, was, yeah. Everybody came on these trips. So it was a lot of fun. And we got to have fun being kids, you know.
Oh gosh, that is that is cool. Did um by the way, you know, it's funny. I think people just kind of think, oh yeah, that's right. Well, he was like a teen heartthrob or whatever. What exactly is that like for a guy, you know, a guy to be like a teen heartthrob and suddenly you you're 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 going out and people are like, hey, that's that's the guy from Growing Pains. What is that like? Is it exciting or is it scary? Um I never found it scary. It was always, you know, I never, except for maybe the first time somebody wanted my autograph where it was like, okay, why? It was just weird to me because I didn't even know what autographs were. I was so young. I mean, it's not like I knew you see a celebrity and you get an autograph. I had no idea why this person would want my, my name on a piece of paper. Um, But after it was explained to me and everything, even from a young age, I just saw it as part of the job. You know, if you are successful, people are going to recognize you and you get successful because those people like you and want to see you. So I just looked at it as part and parcel of the whole deal. Wow. Wow. But I mean, it it was never as intense for me in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I I got mobbed. I mean, I had my moments, um, but for the most part. I didn't experience that too much. Um, the, I think the the craziest one when I was young, young was my very first day back to school after the first season of Growing Pains. Oh, wow. <clears throat> like public school? Public school. Wow. And I showed up on campus and I can't remember if it was the first recess. I think it was. Um yeah, I think it was recess, might have been lunch. We got out of class and I walked to the, you know, the playground area, there were the handball courts and the four score. Totally, court, totally can picture it. Yeah. All that stuff. And the whole school descended on me. I oh mean, my. literally, like the entire school. I got ma, I mean, you know, Jeremy, come wow. play with us. Jeremy, come play with us. Come do wow. this. Come. And it just, it was, I'd never, I mean, I'd barely been getting recognized at that point. Oh, wow. And every kid in school just to say, so I spent the next, I think, week eating lunch in the principal's office and oh, wow. spending recess in the teacher's room and all that kind of stuff and while everybody acclimated to me being there, basically. Oh, wow. Um, but that was, that was crazy. Because I, I I hadn't experienced anything like that before. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I mean, as a kid, I'd go to amusement parks. And once you got recognized, it was going to be a long day. Um, because that's one when you when one per when it happens with one person, then someone sees that one person recognize them. And then it just spirals. Do um, they just follow you through the whole park then? No, th- th- that's the thing. It's 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 more of a can you you know someone will stop? Can you sign an autograph for me? Okay, no problem. By the time I get doing that, five more people are here. Wow! And I stop to sign their autographs. By the time I'm done with theirs, fifteen more people are now here, and wow. so on and so. And you know, after six hundred, seven hundred autographs and you've now spent three and a half four hours of your day at disneyland uh signing autographs yeah it can be a little tough at times but i never said no to autographs um me personally right now i had handlers especially my my step idiot um my stepfather back then yeah who was my pr guy um oh geez he it wasn't good he he turned a lot of things down he'd be pretty rude to people at times you know uh that kind of thing but i never personally said no to giving autographs Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. it was just something i wasn't gonna do so i tried to now that doesn't mean i didn't get creative (laughs) (laughs) what did you do what did you do i mean so i learned that at the amusement park somewhere in that first half hour of signing autographs someone was going to ask me hey where's kirk (laughs) i would pick the ride at that place that was the furthest from me and i'd say yeah he's over at this ride and i mean it would it would be like cartoon (laughs) they they would the tracks in the air the 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 (laughs) lightning from behind them the whole group i mean the whole group 500 (laughs) to a thousand people would just go pouring off into that direction to go find kirk funny and i get to go enjoy my day well first of all i should ask you because most my my subscribers people out there they'll they'll be asking 
what were your favorite episodes of Growing Pains? Oh, I had a, I had a lot. You know, there are a lot that stand out to me. Truthfully, um, there were some that were just really, really fun to film. Yeah, there were some that I just really loved because I thought it was a great show, a great episode, a great, you know, the writing and performances and everything were just amazing. Um, so along those lines, the Sandy dies in the drunk driving accident, you know, episode, oh. one of my absolute favorites, um, just an episode that will blow you away. Mm -hmm. Um Again, it doesn't always have to be the special message ones. No, 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 one no, of, no. One of my favorite What's ones fun? that we did where it was kind of me was the birth of Chrissy. Oh, wow. And me getting to be, you know, show a little bit of that keen, that kid teen angst about, you know, being replaced in the family and all that. And then I have this, this, these wonderful scenes with this older man who's dying in the hospital. Oh, wow. And I don't find out that he's dying until the very, very end of our conversation as I'm leaving. It's just this very emotional, very sweet set of scenes between him and I. Yeah. And, um, I vaguely of, remember that, by the way. It's really one of my it's favorite going my episodes. Head right now. Yeah. But then you also have like the episode where Kirk and I are out looking for paste. Um, you know, it's, I believe it was called Mike and Ben's Excellent Adventure or something like that. And <laughs> Perfect. Where we spend the whole evening chasing girls in a car while trying to find paste for a school project I have. Oh my gosh. And it was just real. It was something like I would have done with my real big brother. And, um, something I had done at the mall with my real big brother. And oh my um, gosh. it was just, it was again, fun to shoot, fun to film. We were out all night. Our day began at 10 PM. So we wow. were, cause they, you wow. know, we had to be out all night filming on location and stuff, or we filmed on the Warner back lot and uh, on New York street. And that stuff. had to be and so fun. It was a blast. And it's just basically me and Kirk. And then we had a couple of guest stars who would kind of pop in for part of the scene, but it was mostly him and I all night and then chasing the girls, which funny thing, one of the girls was Jenny Garth. From oh, really? 902 and oh, yeah. Oh, so wow. We got to spend like two evenings just filming and hanging out with Jenny and the other two girls. I can never remember their names and it's not a fame thing. It's that Jenny and I knew each other for years after that and remained close. I always um, thought she was extremely talented. She's her very life. talented and she yeah. was always very sweet. Her and I, her and I were friends. I mean, not close, close talk all the time friends, but we, right. we kept in touch for a long time. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the kind of things that I remember about filming was the fun we had while doing it. That's what often makes an episode special to me. Did you, you know, one thing that I haven't seen uh, in anything that I read or I looked at is the final episode. I, I, you know, I've talked to different people on my show and some people had no idea that that was the final episode. And then they, you know, they, they get contacted and they go, hey, by the way, it, your show's canceled and it's over. What was the situation with the final episode of Growing Pains? So we... Kind of right up until the end of the season, we didn't know if ABC was going to renew us or not. Okay. There was still talk that we might get an eighth season and they were deciding. Mm -hmm. um, me personally, even as a kid, I followed the trades and everything. I was pretty sure we weren't getting an eighth season. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I knew what ABC had already done to us and they... You know, we ne we never got a lot of respect from ABC, unfortunately. Um, I think part of that was because we were owned by Warner Brothers. They right, didn't, exactly. He didn't own us outright like a lot of their other shows. So they never pushed us as hard. They never fought for us as hard. Um, and we still were their number one show for a long time. So Unbelievable. I take that. But, um, <laughs> but... It, it was just they had started moving us around you know they took us from tuesday nights which was not a big deal but that was their premiere night was tuesday night yeah. they took us off of that and they put us on wednesdays still a good time slot but it killed part of our our older viewership because they put mm -hmm. us up against matlock so oh, yeah. automatically we went from being a top five show to being a top 30 show unbelievable unbelievable like, almost overnight i mean it was wow. 
I mean, I would say I'd say we spent more time in the twenties, and then you know it slowly sure, moved down. Sure, sure, but big, 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 big jump. Yeah, very, very big jump. And then for the last season, they announced they were putting us on Saturday nights. Oh, geez. Wow. Oh, you just muted. You just muted. Just you know, I think you just hit it. There you go. So yeah, so you so you knew it was kind of like, oh, here's the death sentence. We're going to Saturday yeah, nights. If, if, you know, I, even as a kid, I was like, wait a second, this, you know, you don't do this to a show that you're trying to keep around. Wow. Um, because again, the the quality of the show had dropped. I mean, anybody could see that the seventh sure. season was a really rough, rough season. Um, and it just seemed to me that they kind of didn't care. Yeah. Um, so I was expecting us to not get it, but they were still dangling that little bit of hope. Um, it was right before our final hiatus of the season. Wow. And that's when they told us we were not being renewed. We only had uh, three weeks left after this. We had one wow. episode to film, and then we were going to film what was going to be this really fantastic two-parter that was a dream of Chrissy's. Wow. And it was going to be really intricate. I actually got to work with Stan Winston, the amazing uh, special effects. Oh, guy. legendary. Well, I was going to be a uh, the troll living under the bridge in her dream. Oh, so they needed cool. a full face mask. I sat for the, you know, the plaster and the straws and the whole oh, thing. Oh my gosh. And then before it even got done, the whole thing got scrapped because now we're not getting renewed. So they have to write a finale. Wow. So that whole episode, that two-parter got scrapped and our producers in basically two weeks of time wrote a two-part finale episode. Oh my gosh. And and what was that like for you? Even though, yeah, you, you know, you're thinking, yeah, it's coming, whatever. But what was that like for you that, I guess, that final day of shooting? It was nostalgic and not too sad until the final filming like the really the final in front of a studio audience filming um every one of us fought through different moments in that filming to not lose it uh yeah. whether it was behind the door before you entered whatever it was it was it was a little difficult wow. and then we did our final curtain call and that's where we all pretty much just everybody except Alan, because Alan was just always cool. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alan was just always cool. But everybody else pretty much had tears just streaming. I was bawling like, you know, like a little kid. Oh, well, yeah. Um, it was it was hard because you knew it was over and you knew everybody's going to be going their separate ways. But the nice thing was we were all close. And for the for the most part, our core stayed close i mean as a cast we all stayed very close we still are close we're still up in each other's business wow um, we still talk to a lot of different crew members we still talk to a lot of the different production members and you know it's still a big family wow that's really wonderful to hear i love when when people say that what by the way what about um you did a what was it two am i right on that two reunion movies <laughs> Um, what were your favorite memories from from those? Again, for those, the favorite memories really were just us getting to be back together and, you know, mm -hmm. filming and spending time together. Um, right. There was a little bit of apprehension before the first one in 2000, um, not knowing, you know, how this is going to go, how everybody's going to be. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, from moment one, when we all got on set to film, which was a out in a park that day and alan started poking at joanna again <laughs> and everybody just kind of fell right back into place it was it wow. was great it was like old home week and then you know we got to we were filming in montreal which mm -hmm. is a city most of us had never really spent much time in so yeah. in our off hours we were all basically asking Alan, who's Mr. Canada, you know, what do we do? Where do we go? What do we eat? And he's taking right. us all around and he's showing us all this different stuff. And we just, again, all spent time together. So, wow. That's and then cool. 
It's also the trip where Alan introduced me to poutine. My waistline has still not forgiven him. What is poutine? Oh, poutine is essentially French gravy fries or uh, Quebec gravy fries. It's a specialty in Quebec, wow. in particular Montreal. And it's it, now this is the how it should specifically be done. Not every place does this, but okay. it should be older red potatoes, double fried. So you slow fry them to get them cooked and then double fried to get them crispy, then sprinkled with vinegar, tossed with fresh cheese curds. So oh, fresh wow. tweaky cheese. Oh, wow. And then doused in poutine uh, gravy, which is generally a light beef or light chicken stock gravy. And oh, oh, does that sound good? It's the best ever food that has ever been created. It will kill you in a month. But it, <laughs> oh, my goodness, it is so good. And honestly, I had to have gained probably 10 or 15 pounds in the, in the six to eight weeks we were there. And I'm not kidding because we were going and getting poutine every, every day to every other day. Oh my gosh. And wow. uh, anyway, so we just, again, those are the memories that stand out is us all having fun. I mean, the filming's great, but that's the work part. And that's not the part that really stands out. It was all the, no. the memories we got to create while doing it. Yeah, and I think the second one, it was very yeah. much, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no you're not second. cutting me off at all. I was just going to say the offset moments are are the always the most interesting to me, yeah. They are, and they're, they're really the ones that you remember the most. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the second film, we shot in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, <laughs> which for an alcoholic at the time was maybe oh. not the best thing. Oh my um, gosh, that's right. Oh my gosh. But we had, again, had a ball. We had a great time. You know, filming was awesome. I managed to keep it together for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I messed up on day one, got so hammered, and my alarm didn't go off, and a bunch of different stuff that I missed our first reading. Um, we were wow. supposed to sit down for script reading, and I missed it. Um, but from that point on, I didn't miss a single thing, and I kept my act together on filming days. Uh, I was tearing up New Orleans uh, in every other day. Here's the real kicker about that trip. On the same trip, I reconnected with my now writing partner, who I wrote my book with, um, Dr. Brandon Phillips, who was a wish kid. Starlight granted his wish 35 years ago now, or 34 years ago, and his wish was to come to the set to meet me. Oh, is that wild? And him and I maintained a friendship for many years, lost touch, and through wonderful circumstances he had gotten hooked up with kirk and kirk brought him to the set to meet me again oh so wow. one day on set we're sitting there and kirk goes hey i got somewhere someone i want you to meet come with me we go walking around this corner and he goes jeremy this is and the second my eyes laid eyes or i laid eyes on him i looked at him and i went brandon phillips oh my gosh and forgive me here I have to wrap myself out. I am not proud of what I said, but it was an honest reaction because yeah. he was a wish kid. Yeah. So I literally looked at him and said, Brandon Phillips, how in the hell are you alive? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, right. And I was just dumbfounded and I ran up and I gave him a big hug and he's he's my other brother now. I mean, we literally reconnected, spent a bunch of time together in New Orleans, getting reconnected and getting to know each other again. Oh we ended gosh. up, he, he helped, you know, part of the book is how he helped save me from my alcoholism. He was very instrumental in helping me get sober wow. and getting me treatment. And that's what our book is about. It's called When I Wished Upon a Star. And it's kind of a dual biography about how how our lives paralleled for so many years, even though we were such different kids from such different places, and how our lives constantly have intertwined over the last 35 years to kind of make the others better. Oh, my gosh. What a wonder. First of all, what an awesome title. Like, does that hit dead on? Wow, that's a wild story. What happened that, that you you hit that that I guess that mark where it's like, and that's my last drink. Uh, 
Well, at that point, I had tried many, 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 many things. Um, I had tried pretty much every modality of recovery that was out there at the time, and I couldn't make any of them work. I say that because I've had friends who've gotten sober using almost every modality. No, so I get there's it. something for everyone and it can be found, but I That's couldn't correct. make the, I couldn't make them work. Mm -hmm. So we were in Texas um, for Joni's brother's wedding. Mm -hmm. And it was a rather stressful couple of weeks. We got there a few weeks, a couple of weeks before the wedding. And we had to do a lot of organizing and setting up. And you know, there's a lot of tension around a wedding. And I had been kind of white knuckling it for a couple of a uh, couple of weeks and just, you know, staying sober by sheer force. And by the time we got out there, I was tense. Her family was tense. Things were just not good. And I started, you know, heading to the store Fire and only. grabbing, you know, yeah. I started drinking again. And uh, Joni and I had a really, really big blowout. And I was going to leave because I knew I was ruining this. I was going to ruin this wedding because sure. I was drinking, because there was tension. I knew this was going to go really badly. So I said, look, I'm heading to the airport. I'm just going to trade in my ticket and get on standby for something that gets me home now. Mm -hmm. And all she could picture was me going home and crawling to the bottom of a bottle and killing myself. So fair, fair point. She freaked out and she yeah. basically like jumped on my back to keep me from leaving. Oh. And I flung her off of me oh. and I, she kind of, she flew basically halfway across the room into the corner and slammed her arm into something. And it, I hurt her um, oh. and it, it hurt her pretty good. I didn't break anything, but I hurt her and I had never done that before. And it was the breaking point. Wow. Um, I will not say that that was my last drink ever. I've had a couple of small stumbles. I've been very lucky. Mine mm -hmm. have all been like a one-time occurrence type thing rather sure. than jumping off the cliff wholeheartedly. But that was that moment that this cannot continue no matter what. And wow. I was very blessed that my mom found this medically assisted recovery program where there was a medicine that I used in implant form that helped with my cravings and helped me to help me get through those first, you know, six months or so of mental hell. And um, yeah. And how I've long been, has this been now? I've been sober for, what are we going on? Eight years, eight years now, seven years, wow. seven years right now. So yeah, congratulations, Jeremy. Seriously, I, I I don't take that lightly at all. That's just just terrific. Thank you. Wow, wow. What I but thank you for sharing that, by the way, because I I know you I I know because I've watched enough of like you know whether it be interviews or things that have been written about you. I know that you appreciate putting that out there because you're going to save somebody just from that. Like somebody's going to hear that and go, you know what. You know, and that's great. That's really great. I, I hope so. That's why I decided to share my story, you know, so long mm -hmm. ago. Um, that actually was something that happened to me early in recovery when I was still doing, um, I was going to meetings mm -hmm. at the time. And it was one of my first real, real attempts at getting sober. And I had a sponsor and I had all that stuff, but I was still ashamed of it. And I was going, when I was going to the meeting rooms and stuff, I was using a different name, um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And my sponsor at the time outed me to the National Enquirer. You've got to be freaking kidding me, by the way. Nope. For a total, I found out of like $5,000. I was like, really? Oh. You risked my life and my sobriety for five grand. And I mean, that's like, that's like the, it's an unwritten rule. I mean, oh, that is you, just, that is the biggest violation of trust. That is the biggest violation of, I mean, you have laid your soul bare before a sponsor. Yeah. You know, did you, you go back drinking because of that by, by chance? I went, I went out for another, I don't know how many years. Ah, I mean, um, pathetic. That is just, I, I, I don't mean you're pathetic. I mean, that's pathetic. What this gentleman, gentleman or, or woman did. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah, I was, it was not good. It was not good. And it definitely sent me, you know, down a bad road for a while. And uh, needless to say, I had trust issues when it came to recovery. 
for quite a while. <laughs> I think I get it. I think I get it. Well, all right. Well, let me let me take you back. Um, as a child actor, you know, there's the Coogan Law, you know, that's supposed to protect your money and all of that. I am just curious because, you know, here you are, you're whatever, like you said, eight going going all the way through into your teens. What when you turned 18, did you was there a nice, you know, amount of money that had been set aside? Did it work in essence? It does work. And it did work. Um, the problem is when I was 15 and a half, um, I had a accountant who basically didn't pay my California state franchise tax for oh, almost on. seven years. Oh, come on. And he hid the money and did other things with it. And I call it embezzlement, although I'm not legally allowed to say that if I use his name, because it doesn't technically fall under the embezzlement codes. But basically, the guy screwed me big time. And I found out that the government wanted almost $300,000 from me, or they were going to throw my mother in jail. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I didn't, I did not expect you to say that. That is terrible. Cause I thought the whole idea was to not allow something like that to happen. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's unbelievable. So what ended up happening was I had to get emancipated at 15 and a half years old, which is where you legally become an adult. Yeah. Um, so that I could access my trust fund and pay the government off. So when I, turned 18 there was nothing left of that you literally um, turned emancipated yourself to save your mom yeah wow. wow so um it's not that there was nothing left i had a small investment account and a couple of other things but there was nothing near you know what, what had been, been what would have been and what had been saved for me so oh, no the gosh. coogan law definitely works um it's better that it's 15 percent now when i was doing it it was only 10 percent uh, um even that was great it's much better that it's 15 percent now i agree um but again unfortunately that's not a national law oh, that's is that only a california law california and i think three other states that's it Oh my gosh, I never knew that part either. Yep, that's one of the reasons why people love filming in Louisiana and all these other places. There's no child protect there's barely any child protection laws in those states. Oh, how sad. How sad is that? So, oh my gosh. Yeah, if you film in any of those other states, the Coogan law doesn't apply and the parents are allowed to do whatever they want with the child's money. So, <laughs> it's not great. Um No, that that is not great. Still, there's still a couple of organizations lobbying and working to change that. Oh man, if I if I hear anything about that, I'll, I will back that 100. percent Two other uh, two two of my last questions. Did you at the time? Because I you know I lived through that time. I mean, I was a big Growing Pains fan myself, but I was also a Family Ties fan and a big Michael J. Fox fan. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel a competition with that show because you guys kind of were in that same you know <laughs> zone? No, we never felt the competition with any of the shows, really. Um, and especially, I guess, not not Family Ties, because they were on before us, first of right. all. They were, you know, came on a year or two before us. But also, Michael was awesome. Um, Michael and Kirk were kind of friends. He would come by the set to hang out and say hi. And he'd really? pull up and, oh, yeah, he'd, he'd literally show up. He had, I think it was three or five uh, different uh sports cars and i mean high-end sports cars he had a ferrari testarossa lamborghini countach a, a couple of porsches all of them black wow and he'd drive a different one to the set each time he'd come to visit and him and kirk would actually go out to lunch and like their favorite thing to do was pull up next to a car full of girls and roll down the windows and just be like hi oh roll my the windows gosh. back up and drive off um, oh wow but we we didn't have a lot of rivalries really um truthfully the thing the thing you always especially when you were a top show the thing you wanted to beat was monday night football and nobody ever did it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no way i was going to say no nobody way. ever did it even during cosby's run of being number 1 for like 5 straight years 
you know, nobody ever beat Monday Night Football. So, but that no, was not, that was the one that chance. was the one we all wanted to put put down at least once. <laughs> wow. So did by the way, going back to Michael, did because obviously then you're you're you know he's he's older you know than, than you was he uh, was he just you know was he really open and really nice or mm -hmm. could you you know even though he had the cars and that oh was no he... Michael was was just an awesome normal guy. Um, he treated me great. I mean, given I was very young, but he palled around with me and was very kind to me and, you know, always talked to me when he came to the set or visit us, visited us at the schoolroom. Um, oh. So, no, he was a very normal, you know, normal dude, even with all the success. God, I love hearing that. Anyway, I thank you so much for being on. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. Uh, it, it's just been a total pleasure. And um uh, Thanks for opening up as, as, as to everything that you did. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, John. You got it. It's It's been a complete pleasure, believe me. Awesome. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. And uh, please check us out also on youtube.com slash that's classic TV, where you can actually watch and see the celebrities that are on the show. Thanks again. Bye-bye.